Yeah, okay, perfect, great, thanks a lot. Well, welcome to uh, our session uh, for Manager Essentials. Um, I'm focusing on the candidate experience. I think uh, the candidate experience as we start to really grow as an organization is gonna be at the core of everything we, that we need to be focusing on, um, given the fact that the landscape has changed uh, throughout the, the last several years on what candidates are looking for, what candidates are demanding. So a couple of things that you know, we'll focus on is, uh, let me go into presentation mode here. And you guys, can you see the slides okay? Yep, okay, great. So looking at the agenda here, you know, let's, we'll quickly look at the defining the experience, uh, the importance about a good candidate experience, uh, as also what happens if we get it wrong. Um, and then we'll talk about a little bit how, how you know, partners, how hiring managers and uh, recruiting can partner together. Uh, to, to really focus on the candidate experience. Then we'll look at some interview best practices and then I highlight how they find us and how we find them and then uh, have a conversation, uh, open discussion. And throughout this uh, entire session, please feel free to chime in um, either on chat or you know, prefer to even have your, your mic open, it would be preferable as well. So let's look at a quick definition. Um, you know, it starts with them researching our company. And as everyone's probably aware, Glassdoor has become uh, the, the norm where company where candidates go to review uh, what the company is from a culture standpoint, how people like working there, what people's experiences have been, not only working there, but throughout the interview process. Uh, and we'll take a look at uh, some of those a, a little bit later. But as you start to look at Glassdoor, you know, GitLab in itself from a company perspective has probably one of the best in the industry or even from, from a company standpoint with a rating of 4.8. Uh, but then when you start to look at some of the reviews based on our interviews, uh, it doesn't get so good. So you'll, we'll take a look at what some of the candidates are saying and talk about how we can um, help manage that. Uh, and then look at, you know, the, you know, it continues through every touch point. It's not about, it's before they interview, it's during their interview and after the interview is the life cycle of the candidate experience. Uh, and then it doesn't end after the decision is made. It's the lasting memory of the total experience. So even as they come here and once they're as a, uh, here as an employee, we still got to make sure that we're, we're manning to that experience and uh, having it be an extremely positive one. So next, is, I'm just going to play. I got a couple videos in here um, that I'm going to show you as well. I believe I got to take my headset out for you all to hear it. But this is, uh, talks about the, the candidate experience and the importance of it. When it comes to discovering, attracting, and retaining the best talent, one thing we should never underestimate is the power of great candidate experience. Because if an employer gets it right, the results can be truly out of this world. And getting it right has never been more important. Competition for talent is reaching astronomical proportions. Candidates are vital beings, getting on with their own lives, on their own planet, sometimes far, far away or so it seems. And those who require their skills often don't know where to find them. But perhaps the right candidates are closer than they think. But even once the prime candidate is found, employers can struggle to understand them fully, which means reaching out to them correctly can be another haphazard mission. It is therefore beneficial to study candidates more closely, their habits, their preferences, their motivations, in order to get to know them better communicate wisely and win their trust, ensuring nothing gets lost in translation. This kind of research unearths facts that are critical to securing talent. For example, we know that job seeking is now a 24-7 activity, and with mobile technology, 38% search during their commute, 30% whilst on the job, 18% even admit searching when they're otherwise engaged. And although candidates consult up to 18 different resources throughout their job search, we know that most turn to their friends first for information or advice. So, despite technology, word of mouth is still key, and reputation speaks volumes. Either way, the candidate's experience will be directly related to new prospects. If this experience has been good, others are more likely to jump on board. And referral campaigns can be great for attracting newcomers. 
But if the experience was bad, this can upset the ship and ties can be severed, with competitors gaining advantage. So news travels far and wide, and fast. Only 25% of employers regularly request feedback from candidates. 78% of job seekers say they've never been asked. This feedback could tell you all you need to know to improve your prospects. Although the world of recruiting has gone nearly 100% digital, the old rules work the best. Listen more, seek feedback, keep things simple, communicate often, set expectations, and walk in the candidate's shoes, however different they may be. The journey will be one you'll be glad you made, as getting to know your candidates can change your world for the better. So How about now? Good, perfect, yeah. awesome. Thanks a lot for sitting through that. Um, but there's a lot of lots that can be unpackaged there, and as you can see, things are have really changed in in the way we view candidates and the way candidates are viewing us. Uh, you know, this is a slide that I shared uh, when I did our, our functional group update, but it, you know, really think of it as one of our eight values because it, it is truly that important for our organization. Uh, and it's, it, it's really got to be, you know, during the, the, before the interview, during the interview and after the interview, and it's everyone's responsibility. It's not just recruiting. It's not just the, the hiring managers. It's us as an entire organization, just like, you look at diversity is, is everyone's organization. It's not one person's responsibility. And when, when we start talking about setting clear expectations, I think we, we do a, a good job of that, you know, within our handbooks uh, and, and making sure that candidates are um, understanding what they're coming into when they start interviewing with us, but it's not setting just an expectation in writing. It's, it's through every stop of that step of that process. Once they're done screening with a, a, a recruiter, making sure they understand what is that next step going to be. Uh, if it isn't, if they're not moving forward in that process, making sure that they clearly understand that. Uh, we are going a, a hundred miles an hour here. Things are going to fall through the cracks. It's never going to be perfect, but that means more so than ever, we got to pay more attention to it. Uh, and, and always listen, you know, they always say the customer's right. Uh, and sometimes it, it's the customer's not always right, but the, the candidate, you know, uh, if it's if they're not always going to be right e either, but we need to listen to them first, uh, and then obviously be be fair uh, and demand accountability. Accountability for us, and also accountability for the hiring managers that they have to take ownership in that. You know, these are some characteristics. I won't read through them all that of, of a great candidate experience, but um, it it really is responsible. It's the response and and how are we getting back to them. Um, and when I show some of the feedback that we received on Glassdoor, I think we, we need to take a look and, and sit back and say, okay, what, are, what is it that we're doing today uh, that we need to either iterate on because it might've worked you know, when we were a, a much smaller organization, but is it gonna be scalable on how we are going about our interviews uh, and throughout our process? And how, how, do, how can we fix each step of the process to make sure it's time back to a, a great candidate experience? Are there any, I'm going to take a quick pause. Any questions, any comments? No? Okay. Then this might be a quick training session. <laughs> um, you know, why focus on the candidate experience? And then also think about what percentage of those prospects or candidates may be our, our, or our current potential customers. Uh, and, and that's where we want to make sure that if they're having a good experience here at GitLab, um, maybe they didn't get the job, but they had a great experience. So they might take that back to their current company or to whatever organization they go and join uh, and then be, could potentially become value, uh, valuable customers. So this next one is, is a video. I'm not going to play the whole thing, just, just a couple minutes of it. Uh, it's actually a, a Mighty Python skit of, of a bad candidate experience. Um, so you can click and watch the rest of it, but uh, obviously uh, just throw a little humor in there and, and see what a, a bad candidate experience could look like. You know, 
I really enjoy interviewing applicants for this management training course. Come in. <coughs> ah, come and sit down. Good. <coughs> Would you mind just standing up again for one moment? Take a seat. Sorry? Take a seat. Ah. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Tell me, why do you say good morning when you know perfectly well that it's afternoon? Well, well, well you said good morning. <laughs> good afternoon. Oh, good afternoon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good evening. Goodbye. <laughs> no. <laughs> Aren't you going to ask me why I rang the bell? Huh. Uh, why, why did you ring the bell? Why do you think I rang the bell? Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Well, I, I'm too late. Good night. Ding 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 ding. Good night. Ding 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 ding. Um, uh, this isn't. It is the interview for the management training course, is it? Yes. Yes, it is. Oh. Good night. Ding 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 ding. Oh dear, I don't think I'm doing very well. Why do you say that? Well, I don't know. Do you say it because you didn't know? Well, I, I, I... Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Right. <clears throat> so as you can see, <laughs> not, not a good candidate experience, making them feel uncomfortable. Now, can you hear me? Yeah, <laughs> I have to plug it in, plug it in back. Okay. Um, let me just check uh, some chats here. Let me see how I can get to the chats. Okay. Can't be, oh, there we go. Pick it up. Perfect. So, as you can see, made him feel very uncomfortable during that interview. Uh, and, and the way we go about interviews being totally virtual and, and on video, one thing we want to make sure is that they feel comfortable. Um, even if you know, things can happen with technology. Uh, as everyone knows uh, from uh, clearly, with, even with my mic. Uh, so I want to make sure that we make that candidate feel as comfortable as possible uh, from the, throughout every step of that process. So I wanted to throw you know a couple snippets of of what I'm not going to obviously read through these. You you can take your time and go through them. But you know this is what candidates are actually saying about us um, uh, about some of our interviews on Glassdoor. Uh, so we want to make sure, you know, about the process, um, you know, making sure it's not too tedious. You know, we're asking candidates before they're even 100% um, interested in us that we're asking them to take some lengthy assessments, which may not be the, the right approach, right? We want to get their interest level. We want to make sure that we're interested in them before we're asking them to commit a substantial amount of time uh, in, in, in investment in us. If, if we're not even making that connection point yet. Um, you know, when we start looking back at the impression, you know, I never heard back from anyone, even when they were going through the process, even when they, though they came back here and interviewed, the, the fact that we didn't give them a response back is, is not okay, right? Um, I understand if, if people are applying and they're, they're being disqualified right at the resume stage, but if we're engaging with them at any step in the process, um, it, it, we need to figure out a better way and more efficient way to get them the proper feedback. And it's not always coming just from the recruiters. Uh, most of the, the right feedback that we want to give them, the constructive feedback is going to be coming from the hiring managers. So making sure we hold, hold them accountable to get us that feedback on, well, they, did, they completed an assessment, but they didn't pass that assessment. Well, why? Or, you know, the, the, they didn't fit our values. 
well, why didn't I not fit values? Because then they're going to take that feedback and hopefully better themselves, but also make sure that they're not putting remarks out on a glass door like this. Any comments to, to that or questions? No? Okay. No? Oops. I want to go to the next slide. Scott, who should provide the candidate feedback? Should it be the recruiter or should it be the hiring manager? Yeah, that's what, that's what I was saying. I think, or I think it should come from the hiring manager if it got to the hiring manager uh, stage. Um, if it went, you know, if the recruiter disqualified them at the, the at their, their screening stage, then I think it should be the recruiter. But I think the most effective feedback, just like candidates are more responsive if managers reach out to them um, initially to try and, and, and attract them, uh, I think that's going to be more receptive if they receive authentic feedback from the hiring managers as well. Unless I'm, someone disagrees with that. So in general, I, I'd love to see, you know, as much, if not all, of the feedback coming from the hiring manager uh, when possible, because even if it's, uh, even if it's bad news for the, for the candidate, um, communicated right from the hiring manager is going to make it feel like it was more honest and transparent and they had that connection. So in terms of getting positive, you know, referrals and ratings from people who maybe weren't a fit for the role, um, I think the, the more they feel like they were genuinely connected with the hiring manager, the better. I, I tend to agree because I think the hiring manager can also use it as an opportunity to provide coaching with when the right candidates will appreciate and may come back to us in the future. There's always those candidates who aren't interested in feedback and don't want to be better, but we don't really want those people anyway. So <laughs> I think that <laughs> in, investing in, in people, even if we didn't want to hire them right now, but giving them the feedback they need to maybe come back next year and try again, I think is, is great if the manager can provide them some of that coaching. Yeah. And then also, if, if the candidate knows why they, they weren't a fit or were they lacking a certain skill, they may come back and say, ah, you know what, actually someone I work with would be a perfect fit skill wise. Why don't I send them over to you? So then you can start getting additional referrals. But if it's just a blanket response from our system that's saying, thank you for coming in, we're, we're moving forward, it's not going to get the same effect. So are we, um, do you provide that immediately? Because I, I find that... Um, some people are just happy to know what the what the status is of their application like okay i got the client and i'll move on and some people do want feedback but it's it's better to kind of separate the message from hey you're not moving on from and this is the reason why can we what what are we doing are we are we sending the feedback out immediately or do we first say hey you got the client and if you want feedback please let us know yeah, Nani, if you don't mind, I'll throw that over here because you're, you're closer to that and, and getting that feedback. When, when do we typically try to get that back to them? At the moment, because of the volume, we tend to, um, especially if it's at screening level, we don't provide feedback. Um, but 90% of candidates will ask and then we do provide feedback um, or further feedback. Um, I have taken to Bobby's training recently that said, hey, decline right away in the call. It's a lot kinder. So I've started doing that and I do find it a lot more effective and people really take to it. Um, and they even give me feedback in the call then to say, hey, I really appreciate that you were honest. Um, so I actually prefer giving direct feedback in the call. At the moment, from a volume perspective, no, we're sending an email to decline. We're not giving the feedback but we are following up if we then give further feedback. If the candidate was further in the process, I highly recommend that the hiring manager does the feedback and not us. Um, it's a much better experience. So is a good example. He always declines all his candidates directly. It doesn't just take pressure off me to try and waffle some excuse of why we don't want to hire the person. It actually gives like a clear answer or a clear direction for the person as to why we're not continuing. I also think that you need to use some you know, some good judgment. I hear everyone's different and the rapport levels you build are different and the, the level of directness and honesty are different. So there's not necessarily a, a one size fits all to this. This is where we have to understand what kind of connection and relationship we have built with the candidate and what would be most likely what they would appreciate and respect and would work best for them. Uh, I don't, I don't think you can say it's going to be the same for everybody. And I've had different experiences where we decline and then I schedule a meeting for later to offer feedback. I've had candidates who just aren't interested at all in that. And I've had some that are very interested, but if I were to climb someone and they were to ask me why, 
it would be silly for me to say, I'm not going to tell you that right now. That's going to be a separate call. Um, it, it's, it's, much, it's much more organic if they want details of why that you would have that answer. Otherwise, it feels like you're saying no without knowing why you're saying no. Um, so I think that uh, it's important to, to have your facts straight when you go into that decline in case you are questioned. Don't make it a debate. Don't make it an argument. It, it, it's just a matter of here's what our perception is and here's our decision based on that perception. Yeah, and I, I think there's, uh, there's no one size fits all here. Um, unfortunately, I had a lot of success with declining people straight in the call, like Nadia said, people appreciate it and the honesty. But I also had someone recently totally blew up on me when I, at the end of the interview, I expl explained why, why as it was declined. Um, so it matters a lot. It matters uh, what stage someone is in, like the further they are along, the, har the harder the blow. What the, what the interview is, is it a video call or in person? In person will be harder. What kind of a head? Depends on the person. Um, it depends on the reason for declining. If the person just doesn't have the skill set, like the level of skill that you require, that's going to be a tougher message than like, oh, you're, you're really good, but how, we're looking in another dimension. We're looking for, I don't know, public cloud expertise. You don't have that. That's a different message than, look, you're not aware of, uh, of modern X methods. Uh, that, that, that might be the truth, but that's, that might be the truth that you don't want to have at the end of that conversation, but just spread out the, the interview from the decline from the feedback. And I think in general for feedback, uh, the, the rules people have to be open to it and a good way to measure that if, if they ask for it. And even if 90% ask, I, 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 I think it's good for us to just wait for it because that 10% that don't want to hear it, um, it's pretty rough on them if, if you do provide it unsolicited. Yeah, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. The uh, unsolicited is it can be rough, but it can also, you know, I think whether it's solicited or not, it's important that it feel like feedback and be delivered that way, not judgment. And uh, uh, I think that's already a sensitive moment for the candidate and uh, uh, how we deliver that is also important. And uh, I think you need to do it, you know, as if you were talking to a friend of yours who, you know, didn't get a role uh, and, and deliver that in a way that feels like genuine honest, interested feedback, uh, not judgment. Yeah, and I did, I did a training, I just put this in the chat box. I don't want to hijack Scott's um, training here on the whole candidate experience. I think this is probably worthy of its own training on how to give candidate feedback because there are things to avoid and there are things to lean into. Um, I did a training for the recruiting team on this and I think it would make perfect sense for us to do something for the rest of the company as well. So. Um, we will we will add that maybe for our next training that we can go into more detail there on specific candidate feedback, which can be different from current team member performance feedback and things. Hey, yeah. Scott, you, you said we only provide like we only close the loop if we engage with the candidate. Don't we always also close the loop if they just send in their resume and we never engaged? No, no, you know, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So if we never engage with them, they, they'll get a response saying that they're, they're not moving through the process or the resume wasn't accepted. Uh, that's more of a candid response versus because of the thousands of applications we get. But if we actually have a connection point with them, that's when it needs to be a more authentic and, and uh, okay. Have we, do we have that documented somewhere that, where they can read it? Like, Hey, if you, if you just get a decline based on, uh, based on the resume, we're not going to provide details because we got over 400 applications every day. Uh, I'm not sure I can, I can take a look and see, and if it's not, we can, we can do a handbook update for sure. Cool. Yeah. We definitely have a template for it and we are using that, especially if it's completely misaligned. Quick example, barista applying for, now I'm going to wing it, but back in CICD, just using an example. Um, then we literally send that mail to say, hey, thanks so much, not going to provide fe further feedback. But yeah, um, but I think Chloe did do a handbook update. I'm going to try and find it. Okay, great. Thanks, Nadia. Yeah, and it, as you can see, um, the, you know, the, the recruiting has changed forever. You know, the tech, uh, the talent crunch is getting worse. Uh, you know, just today in the U.S., uh, our, our job, uh, uh, our unemployment rate went down to 3.9% or 3.8%. Uh, so there's, there's a lot more, especially the talent that we're going after. 
is, is probably a, a, a lot less, probably less than 1% of, of unemployment for the type of skills that we're going after. Uh, you know, in the, I assume that's US specific, Scott? Yes, yes, the 3.9, that was US specific, yep. Yeah, I mean, but I think from a skill set perspective, it's probably a, a globally where we're, there's probably less than 1% with, with the development staff, is my assumption, because it is difficult to find those folks in, in other geographies as well. Um, you know, candidates are, are obviously a lot more informed. They, they got choices now. Uh, and, you know, candidates are, are picking companies uh, and, and not vice versa. You know, they're picking us. Yes, we're going out there and going after them. And, and I always say, you know, go find that passive candidate. Well, with all the social media and tools out there, everyone's really an active candidate because there's so many ways to, to find information and, and opportunities. It's just a matter of, are we the right fit for them? Uh, and, you know, when we start looking at the, the different workforce that's coming out there with the millennials, you know, that, that they're going to go out there and they're, they're going to do job shopping. They're going to find that company that that's going to make an impact, that's doing things to change the world. So we got to start and this kind of what ties Canada experience and employment branding kind of ties together in some way, uh, because we need to come up with what's our story, what's our message from an employment brand standpoint that's going to get candidates excited on what we are doing because we're doing great things that can, get, you know, can change the way people are doing development life cycles that people would get excited about. We just need to get that out, that messaging out there to them. And, you know, it, again, anyone can be found, uh, you know, with all the social media out there. Uh, it's just a matter of getting the right messaging out to them. Uh, and then speed is the new currency, right? We gotta, we gotta move quickly. Right now, our average um, time to fill is right around 56 days. I would like to see that sub 40, uh, you know, in that, and there's a lot of steps in our process that I think we can tweak up, you know, and speed is up, up, up the utmost importance here because we do lose Canada. We can probably pull some stats uh, and I'll have Chloe pull some stats around candidates that are declining our offers, maybe because of, of, of the time it took throughout the process. So that is something we definitely need to be cognizant of and see what we can do to help it, not only from a recruiting standpoint, but also with the hiring managers. So we're looking at some, some tools that might be able to help with that and, and get it streamlined. And then once the candidate receives an offer letter, um, we're talking about this in our uh, onboarding committee, how do we keep them you know, engaged? How, you know, just, that's not the finish line once they sign that offer letter. There's, there's a period of time to when they still can come back and say, look, uh, I, I received a counter offer. We, we witnessed that this week uh, in, a, in a candidate that we were really interested in. Uh, we have a couple of candidates that have accepted offers, but they're not starting until August. So we, we need to figure out how do we keep them engaged. So we're, we're putting some strategies and thoughts together um, on outreach, not just recruiters doing it, but their, their managers doing some outreach to them as well to keep them uh, engaged there. Scott, I, I would chime in on that. I think especially when you're talking about outreach, post you know offer signing uh the manager's got to be all over that that's not recruiting's job yeah. that's you, you you've gone through this whole process to bring this talent in uh you should be you know if that person's you know really got a pretty long time frame um you, you're effectively doing onboarding and engagement <laughs> uh as you're leading up to that so they can hit the ground running but it's it's uh that's the most important retention period. Yep. It is, it's, it's super critical and it's super critical once they start too. I heard a story recently about a candidate starting in Europe who didn't hear from their manager at all in their whole first week. Not acceptable, right? We've, we've got to be more hands-on than that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you know, next kind of tying candidate experience into you know, the recruiting and hiring manager partnerships. You know, one thing I will, you know, we, we were very reactive uh, in, throughout our process. Now a vacancy gets open, it gets post, gets out there posted, and then we wait for people to apply. I call it the post and pray model. Uh, we want to shift that paradigm to be 100% direct sourcing, uh, but that there's got to be a real good partnership. Uh, and it starts with the job description and making sure that we, we're not just receiving a job description. The, the recruiters are reaching out to that hiring manager and having what I call that intake call. So they truly understand what it is that they're going out there looking for. What are the right ind industry titles? Uh, you know, we, we've done some iteration on some of our titles that might be, this might not be what other organizations are calling them. So we're never gonna find that, that candidate. So that, that's an iteration that we have to look at. What are other companies calling this position? Even though you might have a different internal title, the external posting title might be something we need to, to help attract that, that, that talent. 
Um, you know, and then what is our strategy from just posting versus sourcing uh, and develop a, a, an outreach strategy that, you know, lays out different events and you know, conferences and all that. We don't do a lot of that, but we should be uh, getting out there to some of these conferences that have that talent where, where and, I, and I'm not familiar with all of them. I'm, I'm probably some of the hiring managers are where we know these de de DevOps folks or SDRs might be going to, so we can get a presence and get our messaging out there. And then, you know, schedule update meetings, uh, not just have an, an intake call and we just start working on the rec. We need to be from a recruiting team. We need to be more proactive at partnering with the hiring manager and giving them regular schedule update calls. Uh, if they're weekly, biweekly, whatever they may be uh, to make sure that we're all still aligned because more so than not, recs tend to morph over their, their life cycle. You know, what it was today, and we've interviewed some candidates through calibration exercise or whatever it may be, could be a little bit different tomorrow or next week. So making sure that we're still staying aligned, or if we're continuing to get candidates that are being declined by hiring managers, having that recalibration exercise to say, okay, here's what I'm seeing in the job description. It seems like you're looking for something a little bit different. Uh, so that, that's something that we have to start working on a little bit more as well. Um, and then, you know, our, our participation, like I said, discovery meeting, ongoing touch base meetings, pre-brief meetings before the interview, making sure that we've got the right candidate or the right interview team lined up. Everyone knows clear expectations and then trying to get them through that process as smoothly and with the best experience possible. Hey, Scott, quick question. Are, are there processes right now where, uh, well, I mean, I guess the answer is yes, because I've been a part of some of them, um, that we go ahead and begin interviewing without having the meeting and the pre-brief prior to interviews? Yeah. Is that, uh, is that the exception or is that more common? So I would say that the pre-briefs aren't happening. We're, we're being more reactive. I think we're, we're getting recs thrown to us and we're just posting them and then starting to manage the candidate pool from there. But I think we need to be more proactive at having those pre-brief meetings with the hiring manager and debrief meetings, right? Once we've gone through a selection of interviews, um, it, it, we want to pre-brief. Here's the candidates that we've interviewed this week or interviewed uh, over the past two weeks. Let's have a, a discussion on, you know, who we're moving forward with on the next step. Yeah, because I mean, it feels like I mean that could just be a gate, right? You don't you don't get to post the job until we've had the uh, the previous meetings, or you don't get to these start interviews. We won't schedule any interviews until we've had that. Yeah, uh, to make sure that that's a priority. This is so important for a manager. You should absolutely have the time and interest uh, to make sure that happens quickly uh, to keep everyone on the same page. Yeah, thank you for that. Absolutely. So. You know, let us help help you as hiring managers. You know, what is the target population? You 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 you're living and breathing the uh, the the skills and, and working with the technology. So during those pre brief why it's important to say, okay, what are the competitors we want to go after or don't want to go after, uh, or who's you know hands off? You know, when we do executive search briefings, you know, we we have those discussions. Who who should we go after? Who shouldn't we? Because they're they're a customer, uh, and we don't want to rock that boat. Um, what are, obviously, what are the software and technologies, industry domain names, what are the soft skills? Uh, yes, we have, we have a culture within uh, GitLab, but you, you know, this, that, that's not just about soft skills. It's what's the, the culture or the, the skills that the hiring manager is going to have uh, that we can match up with the right candidate. Because it, it's more importantly, it's, it's having that right culture mix, mix with the, that specific manager versus the country and making sure that they're going to be able to uh, work good to, uh, together. And then obviously looking at employer referrals, that should be the first, first question we ask uh, before we ever post a rec is what, inf what employer referrals, what referrals do you have? Who should we reach out to your network? Even if you, you don't have, um, you know, specific relationships with them, you know, point us in the right direction. I think we've, we've made some great strides over the past uh, couple of months with doing source-a-thons uh, where we actually sit there with the hiring managers and, and look at, your profiles online and, and do calibration. And then they'll say, go out there and reach it. Even the executive staff uh, has done that and we'll take that list and go out there. So we need to make sure that's happening on a regular basis and not just for uh, a, a one-off rack, but make sure we're doing that on a consistent basis. Uh, and then I just threw some interview best practices here. Uh, you know, you can read them at your own leisure, but I think um, one thing I, I, I want to focus here is looking at, 
the way, and, and there is a, a handbook um, update where we're trying to get, and I think you think of it as going to an on-site interview, right? If you're going to an on-site interview, you're, you're going to meet with several people during that day. You might come back maybe one other time. But right now we've got time slots where a candidate might stretch out a week or two. Uh, let's try and make it so it's a better experience where we carve out either, we either set up interview days or we do a couple panel interviews, which we've, we've seen to be very successful, at least on my recruiting team, we've, we've done those, uh, as well as maybe back to back. You know, let's, let's carve out two hours out of the candidate's day to have interviews with a couple hiring managers. So, so at the end of that, that day, the recruiter and the hiring manager can partner up and say, okay, you, interview, you interviewed so-and-so candidate, are we moving forward to the next step? Or even a couple candidates in a day, and then make a decision at the end of the day. Yeah, I think this is super important, Scott. I think that, um, you know, in the past, I've been at companies that prioritize interviewing um, monk, uh, as top to all other meetings. Um, and to me, that can be even more possible at GitLab because we talk about our meetings being asynchronous and making sure that people in different time zones can participate. I also think that can apply to if, if right now I could have been interviewing a candidate instead of being part of this training, um, I could have still watched this training, I still could have gotten access to the content, but I couldn't necessarily get back to that candidate. And if we make candidates wait too long in the interview process or it feels too broken up and not fluid, um, it's not a great candidate experience. So I think we need to do more to prioritize interviews in our schedules when we have important roles to fill. I, I agree. I think one of the uh, constraints that you know the traditional on-site interview process at uh, traditional companies uh, is a benefit because if someone's flying in or driving in, you sort of have to make sure you get all the interviews done. And so, of course, everyone seems to find the time and you, you make good use of their time, uh, but you also can, can communicate really efficiently uh, across the team. Um, I also think when you do those blocks, uh, it's a little bit easier to make sure that you stack up the responsibilities for each of the interviews so that each interviewer has a different responsibility so that they're not getting the same interview questions over and over again. Uh, if you are coordinating a, you know, a series of two or three or four, um, obviously you're not going to want to make that candidate do the same thing four times. I think that we probably are a little bit less disciplined about that when they've got four over four weeks. Um, each person starts setting their own agenda for the interview. Yeah, and you start, and the candidate stops for, starts forgetting about what they've already covered. Um, the managers can stop forgetting. You know, wait, I saw a candidate I really liked last week. Were they were they better than this one or not? It's been a while. I had to go back and review my notes. Um, it's just the the doing things in a tight time frame. I think is super important when it comes to to hiring. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so during their interview, you know, just a couple things, obviously interview etiquette, making sure that they were making them feel comfortable, um, making sure that we are prepared as well uh, with what we want to be asking as far as questions um, and prepare to, you know, uh, prepare to talk about values, talk about GitLab as well as the position. Uh, and then, like I said, we just talked about managing the interview, making sure that uh, it, it's clearly defined and then setting the right expectations. That, that, that is the most important is making sure that, that we're setting those expectations. Uh, and even if we say, look, this interview process might take a couple of weeks and, and you're going to interview three or four different people over a period of time. If we set that expectation, it goes a lot further than, than just a waiting and, and assuming something is going to happen. Uh, and then, uh, you know, the selection profis, uh, profile, obviously, profile match, all skills, culture match. I think we do a really good job with the, the, the culture fit, uh, making sure the uh, career goals align, and then obviously the technical skills. And then the rest is just, you know, this is how they find us. This is how we find them uh, with the tools that we've got internally. Uh, and we're starting to look at other ways on how we can reach out to folks uh, and how we can engage with them because it's more about engagement than outreach. We can find people, it's just how, how do we engage with them. Uh, and then, so right now we're currently using as our technology, obviously Lever, as everyone knows, LinkedIn, we've, we've recently uh, pushed out a, a, a broad campaign, uh, well, job posting campaign, and, as well as uh, uh, ad impressions, which has generated uh, tons of, of activity. Uh, I think it was last week we had upwards of 3,000 applications. Uh, and one thing going back to the Glassdoor review, uh, and I saw a stat, I think it was 90% of the people 
before they apply to a job, go on Glassdoor to read the reviews. So just think about that. 90% of those 3,000 actually went and looked at our reviews before they applied. So, so now that puts pressure on the recruiting team because now we've, we've, we've got to manage that flow and make sure we manage that experience because if there's applications that are not getting reviewed, uh, we, need to under, we need to get communication back to them on why they weren't a fit or if they're going to move forward. And then, um, you know, we use Stack Overflow as well to, um, to engage with candidates. And then we're also using some diverse sites, uh, as I mentioned up here, like Power to Fly and, and some others. So, open discussion. I know we only got a, a couple minutes left. Is there anything else you want to cover or, or discuss, debate, anything? Hey, Scott, can we go back to slide number five? Slide number five. I don't have the numbers here. Sid, what one was that? Career thing? experience, uh, the trash truck. Oh, the trash truck. Okay, yeah. So uh, someone correctly pointed out that uh, it would be our seventh value candidate oh. experience since we have six values. Uh, but I don't think you should think of it as a, as a separate value. I think you should see candidate experience in the light of our current values. So our values are collaboration. And that means not treating the, treating the candidate as someone on an equal level, not, not as some, uh, some, some pawn that we're, that we're moving around, but uh, a future colleague and someone we should treat even better than our current colleagues. It's about getting results about uh, like at the end, finding the right, uh, the right person uh, it's about efficiency, not only for us, but also for the candidate. Not letting someone know where, what their, that their state changed is, is leaves people hanging, leaves people wondering. They can't move on to, their, to, to the next thing. Uh, they can't close it off in their head. So that's not efficient for them. It's about uh, diversity and attracting a broad range of candidates and, and making sure that, uh, that, we, that our filters don't uh, discriminate unfairly. It's about uh, iteration. Um, I'm not sure how to weave iteration into it. And the last value is, is transparency. It's about like letting the candidate know what stage they're at and if they want feedback, give them, give them that feedback and give it in a, in a way that's actionable uh, for them. No, thank you for that, Sid. That, that, uh, that's spot on, I think. Yes, and I'm not sure where I got eight from, but. <laughs> We'll, we'll, we'll change that for sure. But yeah, you're, you're, you're weaving it in. Uh, and, and again, that's kind of, maybe it's to the core of our values. Candidate experience can be at, at some of the core of, the, of those. Thanks. Anyone else? I, mean, I think to, to add to uh, Sid's, you know, I think values point is it definitely is within our, our values. And really you know, every manager should be thinking about this uh, as a customer experience, right? We're trying to delight uh, each of these candidates because obviously, hopefully, whichever one we select, we want to, uh, to accept, uh, but all the others might be future candidates or certainly referrals to other future candidates. So, uh, you know, we should be thinking about this as, you know, how do I, it's not how do I get through this process and select somebody, it's how do I really make this a delightful experience? And if, you know, we were to follow up w with a survey to each of these candidates, they'd say, yeah, it was actually a great experience and I actually really liked, you know, they wouldn't say that guy who interviewed me. It's like, Mike, I really enjoyed, you know, the conversations with Mike and, you know, I want to keep in touch with him. Uh, you know, when I decline uh, a candidate and they send me a, a, a LinkedIn request and want to keep in touch for the future and want to grab coffee someday, that's a good sign that we had a good process. Scott, just out of curiosity, we've been really, you know, highlighting um, referrals in our team calls. We've been trying to ask for those. How has that gone? Are we, are we, are we, make, are we being successful at making every team member feel like they're a scout for this company looking for the best talent or is there more we need to do there? I think there's, I think there's more we can do there. Uh, and I think with pulling referral programs, it all starts out to um, making sure that we are, reaching out to that referral. Uh, and I did a, a survey back in uh, North of Grumman days and asked, what can we do to, to improve the candidate or to improve the employee referrals? Um, and, you know, some people came back, offer more money, but it was like less than 1%. But every single, most of the response were just, just reach out and consider my referral. Even if there's not a job today, uh, there may be one tomorrow, 
Uh, I think we need to do that more often. Uh, but again, I think that's, that's something that we, we need to, we need to prioritize, right? You know, because we're moving so fast trying to hire so many people, but I think our messaging needs, needs to be better to our employee population on how to refer people. Um, and then where do their, where are the referrals within the process? Uh, have they been reached out to? Are they being interviewed? Uh, and I think there's ways that we can use our tools to, to be able to do that. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. If, if, there's, if there's referrals that we're not following up on, that's obviously a, a, a big miss, not only for the person that referred them, but for us, a, you know, a, a referral is you know, presumably um, filtered through someone that we already trust their judgment. Uh, so that, that should get uh, a pretty good look. Yeah, and, and not only reaching out to the referral, but the person that referred them and just saying, hey, I, I, I reached out to them. Doesn't seem like they're a fit for what we've got here today. Uh, love to keep them uh, you know, uh, within our pool for, for our other future uh, opportunities, but thank you for that referral. You know, keep them coming. Okay. Anything else? Great. Well, thank you everyone for your time. Uh, this is my first training session I've done in, uh, in a long, long time. So uh, hopefully it was valuable, uh, value add to you. And if there's other things you want to discuss around this, please feel free to reach out to me anytime. Thanks, Scott. Thanks all.